I think everybody knew that Ben was going to make it. Because he's really a good actor. He's really a good singer. He's really a good dancer. Join us, the beauty power. Bob Fosse always told me that a show like Pippin couldn't be done without Ben Vereen. The winner is Ben Vereen. <laughs> They were saying that uh, here's this black man in blackface shuffling around like an Uncle Tom and saying, yes, sir. It was very damaging. My dad, yeah, he's been, he's been through a lot. He's had a hard life. Coming at you. Pure talent mixed with desire helped to transport Ben Vereen from the streets of Brooklyn to the top of the entertainment world. But on one night in 1992, Ben Vereen almost lost it all. Ben Vereen was on the operating table for four hours. The Chevy Suburban that hit him caused major internal injuries and fractures. He was nearly given up for dead, and his recovery was grueling. But in less than 10 months, Ben Vereen came roaring back on stage in Jelly's Last Jam. Sweet Papa Jelly! It was a triumphant return for an entertainer who both on stage and off tried to please everybody, but often struggled to find himself. After World War II, many black families in the South were struggling to find work and escape the restrictions of a still segregated society. James and Pauline Vereen were living in Miami and barely getting by on low-paying jobs. Each had been married before and had grown children. In 1946, they wanted to start their own family. Their first and only child was born on October 10th of that year. His name was Benjamin Augustus Vereen. Within months, the Vereens joined the black exodus out of the South and came north, settling in Brooklyn's Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood. There were jobs in Brooklyn, and blacks didn't have to ride in the back of the bus there. Still, progress for blacks in Bedford-Stuyvesant was rare. It was a poverty-stricken neighborhood. There was a sense of um, despair that you could see among many of the people who lived there. There's a sense of um, not much potential. The Vereens were not the type to protest or wallow in despair. They had modest aspirations. They simply wanted a better life for their son, Ben. James got a job in a local paint factory, and Pauline worked as a wardrobe attendant in a local theater. And to earn extra money, Pauline took in foster children. New kids were constantly showing up on her doorstep. For black families back in, in that day and, and before, that's, that's nothing. You had 10 and 12 children in the house, you know. It, you know, you had a lot of children, you know, and uh, everybody cared for everybody. Ben often got confused by the constant comings and goings, but as an only child, he enjoyed the companionship of the other children. And his mother made it clear that her bunny, as she called Ben, was special. She protected him, even spoiled him, buying him new clothes, cooking his favorite foods, and taking him to the beach. On his own time, Ben played on the streets, making games out of what he saw on television. The Rifleman, I think, was a series that was out around that time, and uh, we used, the, you know, if he had the rifle, then he was the Rifleman, so he was the good guy, and I was the bad guy, uh, and we did that sometimes for hours in, in the evening. Many nights, Ben avoided coming home altogether. By the time he was in grade school, his father started drinking heavily. His mother also drank, and when the two of them started arguing, Ben did his best to stay out of the way. It wasn't like Ozzie and Harriet, far from it. And I never knew until actually we were adults. I never really knew how, how dysfunctional his family life was. Ben was in danger of getting lost amid the shuffle of foster children and his parents' bouts with drinking. When he was seven, a friend of the family, thinking Ben needed spiritual guidance, took him to church, the Pentecostal church, where devotion to God is released in unbridled expressions of joy. Ooh, talk about get down with the spirit, get down with the Lord Jesus Christ and sanctification. Talk about dancing. 
You know, when the Spirit hits you, people would dance. And they'd sing, they'd make a mighty no noise unto the Lord. And that might have been as close to show business as Ben Vereen ever got. But one day, when Ben was eight, a salesman came knocking on the Vereen's door. He was promoting the Star Time Dance Studio. I go upstairs to the apartment. He takes my leg and he bends it to the, to the by head, back of my head, and he stretches it here and he stretches it. He got me doing all these things. I want to smack this guy. You know, my, you know, my mom says, "Oh, he's going to the school. You're going to the school." So I said, "Oh man." So next thing I know, I get a pair of tap shoes. In the beginning, he was hesitant to go to class, but the man from Star Time was right. Ben quickly showed a natural talent for dancing and singing. Adults asked him if he wanted to be the next Sammy Davis Jr. Ben liked the sound of that. By the time he was 10, Ben was performing in local variety shows and touring area hospitals, entertaining patients. And when he was 14 and approaching his junior high school graduation, one of Ben's teachers told him about the High School of the Performing Arts, where the city's most talented students were trained for careers as actors, musicians, and dancers. Getting in was tough, but in 1960, the school was actively looking for young black dancers like Ben. This was a time when the civil rights movement was just starting to pick up speed. I think there was a, a feeling on the part of many people in, in institutions of that type that there had to be an acceptance of minority performers. Ben's mother was thrilled when he told her he was accepted. His father was less pleased. He thought it was unmanly for his son to jump around the stage in tights. His disapproval hurt Ben. Nevertheless, Ben found the school in Manhattan liberating. For the first time in his life, he was encouraged to express his creativity, as seen here in some rare footage from the time. On stage and in the classroom, Ben's teachers made it clear that being poor and black didn't matter. His talent alone would help him succeed. There were people you saw and you said, this person's going to go places, definitely. If nothing else, they're going to work. And he was one of those people. I mean, he was just into it. Dancing and acting weren't his only talents. Like many young men in the early 1960s, Ben was starting to show off his singing voice. In his spare time, he formed a gospel group called the Sensational Twilights and sang in churches in the neighborhood. One program I went to, my brother said, come on, I want you to meet my friend. He's a terrific singer. His name is Ben. Uh, he's the black Fred Astaire and uh, uh, the upcoming Sammy Davis Jr. I said, yeah, sure, okay, you know, and I met Ben and sure enough, he. He sang, Mary, Don't You Weep. He tore down the house. And in the process, captured Andrea Townsley's heart. At 18, Ben seemed worldly and sophisticated to Andrea. She was only 13 and the daughter of a bishop. That made it risky for Ben to get involved with her. But nevertheless, the two started seeing each other. By 1964, just as Ben was getting ready to graduate high school, 14-year-old Andrea told him, she was expecting a baby. I didn't know what to do, um, but I thank God, you know, that I, I had godly parents that loved me and at that time, you know, showed me love instead of a lot of rebuke. Ben's parents felt differently. They feared marriage would ruin his chances for a show business career. Ben ignored their advice and married Andrea, Yet by the time Ben Jr. arrived in July of 1965, his 19-year-old father was scrounging for nickels in a series of low-paying acting jobs. Marriage is hard for adults, and we were very young. We did not have a lot of money. He was struggling. It was a very hard time for us. By late 1965, Ben was losing his battle to make it in show business and support his young family. He couldn't do both. Show business won out. At the age of 19, Ben abandoned his wife and infant son and took an apartment in Brooklyn. Ben was free to do his own thing. Andrea was forced to go on welfare. Angry, yes, of course. Of co well, I was in love. <laughs> I was in love, and I came from a very strict church background. And I should listen to my parents. I really should have. 
Um, but at the time, I thought I could be the man and um, wanting to do the right thing. But sometimes wanting to do the right thing and doing the right thing is two different things. Whether leaving his wife and son was doing the right thing or not, earning a living was still not easy. He fell behind in the rent, and his landlord threatened to evict him. In the fall of 1966, he read about an open call audition for an out-of-town production of Sweet Charity. He was desperate for a job and competed against hundreds of other dancers for a part in the chorus. Ultimately, he found himself face to face with the show's director, Bob Fosse, then had less than a minute to impress the legendary showman. He stand in front of you and he'd go, you you thank you you stay you go Whew. ben made the cut he was going to travel with the show to las vegas his teachers were right it didn't matter if he was a poor black kid from brooklyn join us sit his talent was going to take him places he never dreamed We've got magic to do just for you. In 1967, a 21-year-old Ben Vereen had gotten his first big break in show business. He was appearing nightly in Bob Fosse's adaptation of Sweet Charity in Las Vegas. For the first time in his life, he was making a regular income. He was also gaining a reputation as an all-round entertainer. Some even compared him to Sammy Davis Jr., whom he had idolized. To follow in Sammy Davis's footsteps means that he tapped into an older tradition of um, black performers, vaudeville performers, who were capable of doing many things. No one can quite come up to Sammy's level on all of those. But uh, Ben Vereen comes very close to what uh, Sammy was doing at that time. Ironically, the following year, when Fosse turned Sweet Charity into a film, he cast Sammy Davis Jr. to play the part of Daddy Brubeck. It was the same part Ben Vereen had been playing on stage. All Ben managed to get was a small part in the chorus. But it put him in close contact with Davis, who in 1968 invited him to join his touring company of the drama Golden Boy. In the late 60s, Sammy Davis Jr. was an odd choice for a role model. He was respected for helping to integrate Las Vegas, but his embrace of Republican politics and his marriage to a white woman hurt his credibility, especially among younger people in the black community. Ben chose to ignore those shortcomings. Sammy Davis Jr. could help his career. One of the things about Ben Vereen, it seems to me, is that he is a very likable person and he's a person who goes out of his way to, well, ingratiate himself is, is, is perhaps too strong, but he realizes how to play certain politics in order to, to make himself um, friendly with the powers that be. The strategy paid off in the fall of that year. With Golden Boy playing Chicago, Sammy paved the way for Ben to go on stage. The older actor watched from the wings and afterwards said Ben had the makings of a star. Ben's professional life was taking off and his personal life was changing too. He started dating a beautiful young dancer on the show named Nancy Bruner. And even though he had left his wife and son to concentrate on his career, Ben now felt confident enough to start a relationship again. This, however, was going to be different. Ben and Nancy were an interracial couple at a time when it was still considered taboo. They were often treated with ridicule and scorn by whites and blacks alike. I mean, even just going places was difficult uh, with the remarks that people uh, make and, uh, you know, uh, living in. I, I think they did have some difficulty even with her uh, side of the family. In 1969, as Golden Boy ended its run in London, Ben and Nancy were trying to figure out how to find their next paycheck. A fellow actor told them a new musical called Hair was auditioning in Los Angeles. Together, they scraped up enough money to buy plane tickets to LA. This young guy came, came in who was this incredible singer, uh, dancer, mover, with wonderful power. 
movement wise he was just extraordinary the musical hair focused on the rebellious youth of the late 1960s a time when hippies grew their hair long smoked pot and dreamed of the age of aquarius the musical celebrated a world that saw past the distinctions of race and class we'd walk around and just you know what i'm bandanas on and you know and oh god there was hair there was a time when, when america was experimenting with drugs you know uh, looking for a higher consciousness and we started dropping acid and, and contemplating our navel buttons you know and things like that but privately ben says he did his best to keep his drug use under control he and nancy were setting down roots trying to save money by the spring of 1970, they were living in a converted garage and anxiously awaiting the birth of their first baby. To their surprise, she came two months early. They named her Malaika. She was so small, Ben was afraid to pick her up. He made a vow to never abandon his new family. In the fall of 1970, Ben migrated with the company of Hare north to Berkeley. It was there where he auditioned for No Place to Be Somebody, Charles Gordon's powerful examination of racial identity in America. And Chuck was a rough guy. I went up for the part of Johnny, the pimp. And he says, you've been doing that hippie show, haven't you? <laughs> I said, uh, yes, I have. Yeah, you talk like it. You talk like it. What's wrong with you? Where's your blackness? Where's your blackness? You're supposed to be a black man. This move, this place is about a black man. It's a pimp. You ain't no pimp. Look at you. You are a hippie thing. <laughs> and even though he got the part, the criticism touched a nerve. Ever since he'd left Brooklyn, Ben had tried to smoothly fit in a white world. And in 1971, at the height of the black power movement, Ben was being dressed down by a respected black playwright or not being black enough. It seems to me that he believes in a very non-racial society. It's almost a colorless society for him. I think his, uh, his dating habits and his friends demonstrate that. Given that, he was simply being himself and reflecting what he really thought about the world. If he was idealistic about race, it was reflected in his own interracial family. And that family was growing. Ben was performing No Place to Be Somebody in Berkeley when he got news that Nancy was on her way to the hospital to deliver his next daughter. Naja was born as Ben was taking a curtain call. And I ran out the theater. I didn't even finish my bow. I ran out the theater, ran to the hospital, and uh, Naja was here. Ben had little time to settle down for family life. In the summer of 1971, he got another call from Tom O'Horgan. He wanted to know if Ben was interested in playing Judas in his upcoming production of Jesus Christ Superstar in New York City. Judas was on the next plane. Tell me what you think about your friends at the top. Who do you think beside yourselves the pick of the crop? He brought a shine to it that was incredible. The brilliance of uh, vocal power and physical power, plus being able to act that very complicated part that needed to be uh, sympathetic and uh, hurt and uh, lost. Did you think you die like that? Was that a mistake? Or did you know your messy death would be a record breaker? On October 21st, 1971, Ben made his Broadway debut as Judas Iscariot. It was a big night, and for Ben, it was especially sweet because of someone else who was in the audience. His father, who had scoffed at his choice of a career, had come to see him. It's the first time he's ever come to see me perform. Jesus Christ, Woo! Jesus Christ. This is exciting. And I go, well, what do you think, Dad? And he said, boy, you better put some clothes on. You're going to get a cold out there. <laughs> this is what he said about my show. That's, how he, that's what he, all he had to say about my show. That was it. Jesus Christ Superstar was a huge hit. Ben was singled out in the press as the best and most attractive star in the cast. He was nominated for his first Tony Award in 1972. And although he didn't win, Ben was now courted by the man who gave him his first break in the business, Bob Fosse. He had a new musical in the works called Pippin. The role was the leading player, 
And when it originally began, the leading player wasn't really that much leading. It was a smaller role. And as the show developed, uh, Fosse kept expanding his part. Bob pushed everybody hard. Uh, and that was what was great about him, because he got the best out of all of us. Uh, what he did with Ben, to my knowledge, was harness Ben's energy. The role would give him a chance to trade in his scruffy and radical image for a more sophisticated look. It would also be his first truly starring role on Broadway. Join us, the beauty flower. Join us, leave your cheese to sour. Pippin shot Ben into stardom. He developed a great way to sell a song. Once he developed the confidence to do that, there was no stopping him. The winner is Ben Vereen. Ben's memorable sprint up the aisle to accept the Tony Award in 1973 for Best Actor was a reflection of just how far he'd come. He was suddenly the hottest star on Broadway. But soon Ben Vereen would put all that success on the line with one controversial performance. It was a show that would do him lasting harm. It's Ben Vereen. Ben Vereen? No, Ben Vereen. He's quite a singer, that Ben Vereen. By 1975, Ben Vereen's Tony Award on Broadway had opened up more opportunities for him in Hollywood. That year, NBC gave Ben a chance to host his own variety show. It was called Coming At Ya. TV was looking for a certain kind of black person to promote. And Ben Vereen had a, had, has a personality that's very promotable. The smile, the charm, the relaxed um, demeanor, the lack of rancor about race. Coming at ya. Though Coming At Ya got great ratings, it was just a summer replacement. NBC decided against picking up the show. Nevertheless, for Ben, the show had given his career a tremendous jolt, and he was now fielding offers for other television and movie work. That same year, after the birth of their third daughter, Kabara, Ben and Nancy decided it was time to get married. So Ben flew to New York and finally obtained a divorce from his first wife, Andrea, who was still trying to raise his son, Benji, on what little money he sent her. We made ends meet. <laughs> we made ends meet, you know? We didn't, we didn't get a mansion and all of that, but we made ends meet. Back in Los Angeles, Ben's career was taking off. He'd just finished work on Barbara Streisand's new film, Funny Lady. It was the sequel to Funny Girl. In the film, Ben played Burt Robbins, a black entertainer. The role was based on the real life story of Burt Williams. Burt Williams, during his time, was the highest paid performer in the Zico Follies. He was uh, compared to Charlie Chaplin, his and is considered one of the greatest comedians of the first half of the 20th century, along with Chaplin. But despite his success, Williams was forced to appear in blackface whenever he performed in front of a white audience. Ben, who still remembered being accused of trying to ignore the fact that he was black, saw in Williams the opportunity to make a statement. He decided to create a one-man stage show about the life of Burt Williams and incorporate it into his stage act. He also decided to appear in blackface, just like Burt Williams. Waiting for the robot here lay. By March of 1976, when he performed in front of President Gerald Ford at the White House, Ben's Burt Williams routine was a signature part of his act. But some critics found it hard to stomach. It was almost as if, uh, it, uh, I guess, brought back visions of the plantation. Um, and um, the white uh, plantation owner, who was in charge of blacks, putting them in their places and having the slaves come up and dance for them. Ben ignored the criticism. He believed he was doing a great service by spreading the word about Burt Williams. And for the next year and a half, Ben toured the country with his stage act. 
Though he didn't like the long absences on the road, Ben felt he had to work to support his family. I missed him when he was gone. So it was just a great feeling to know that he was, you know, going to walk through that door soon. You know, we kind of would look out the windows or we'd be outside waiting for him, that sort of thing. When he came home, it was like you knew we were going to have fun, you know? Oh, he's home. He's back. OK, where's the presents? When are we going to Disneyland, you know? Because <laughs> he always brought a good time. By 1977, Ben's one-man show was losing some of its appeal. He had alienated some of his black audience, and the white audience seemed less interested in it. Then he heard about a new television miniseries that was going into production. The series was Roots, Alex Haley's epic saga about his family's struggles from slavery to emancipation. Ben begged for a part. I couldn't get arrested for Roots. My agency kept telling me, we can't get you an audition, we can't get you an interview. This time, Ben's Burt Williams routine actually helped him. An executive producer for the series saw it and was so impressed, he persuaded the network to hire the 30-year-old Ben for the role of Chicken George. It was the part of a lifetime. They ain't got no hope so long as Master Moe's alive. Man ain't worth a chicken. He ain't alive. Mama, get off my way. I'm so a dog. If you're the worst friend there is. Uh, killing Master Tom Moe, that's the moment killing a dog in the moon. No, damn it, no. He's your daddy. There were a lot of emotions that Ben went through, naturally, because of the treatment that uh, a man, I mean, these were men, and they were treated like they were dogs. And so uh, we it wasn't a lot set where we were laughing and giggling a lot. Ben was nominated for an Emmy and won the Television Critics Circle Award for his portrayal of Chicken George. That same year, he witnessed the birth of his fourth daughter, Karan. Ben Perrine was on a roll, both in his personal life and his career. And in 1979, just as he did with Pippin, Bob Fosse came calling. He wanted Ben to electrify the final scene in his new movie, All That Jazz. Bye-bye, love. Bye-bye, sweet caress. Hello, emptiness. I feel like I could die. Bye-bye, your life, goodbye. Bye-bye, my life, goodbye. Bye-bye, your life, goodbye. Oh, he was great. He was at the one of the big heights of his career then. There were many heights to his career. And he was just fabulous. In January of 1981, Ben was one of the most popular entertainers in the country. And once again, he was invited to perform for a Republican president, this time at the inaugural gala of Ronald Reagan, a politician that many in the black community felt was anti-black. And here tonight, to play tribute to Burt Williams, is Ben Vereen. Ben, who had been criticized before when he performed the Burt Williams routine in blackface, truly believed he'd been misinterpreted. He decided to take the gamble and do it again. Peoples. Real live people. The live audience saw the entire performance, complete with Ben's explanation about who Burt Williams was and why he was in blackface. All most people at home saw was a short clip of Ben Vereen shuffling around the stage in blackface. The performance set off a storm of controversy, especially in the black community. They were saying that uh, here's this black man in blackface shuffling around like an Uncle Tom and saying yes, sir, in front of uh, one of the most racist presidents um, the country had seen in some time. And why was he doing this? It cost him with um, quite a few African-American people because they didn't understand, you know, Ben was such a, a, a major entertainer and they just couldn't understand where he was coming from and why. I got people saying, we're going to watch your show from behind a rifle. You know, I got, I got a lot of threats like that. But I wouldn't stand down. Dick Gregory came to my side and stood with me. He said, Ben, you got to apologize. I said, I can't. I can't. My people went through this. My people, they bled through this. 
I can't. With all the controversy, it appeared that Ben Vereen's career might now be over. He thought he had hit rock bottom, but this was just the beginning. So I decided I'd go looking down upon the levee. In 1981, Ben Vereen found himself in the midst of controversy following his performance in blackface at the inaugural gala of Ronald Reagan. Critics applauded his intentions at honoring Burt Williams, but questioned his judgment over the appropriateness of the material. Even his children were affected. And growing up, I also encountered that with some of my friends whose parents would say, you know, oh, you know, Uncle Tom Coon, he did this and that for the president and that. It's hard being young and going into a pharmacy or drugstore to get candy and you see your father on the inquirer, cover the inquirer, or people or, you know, business out in the streets. Ben tried his best to restore his battered image. That year he returned to television in a short-lived series called Ten Speed and Brown Shoe with Jeff Goldblum. Ben also tried to repair some damage to his personal life. But when he sued to obtain custody of his son, Ben Jr., the tabloids jumped on the story. They accused him of abandoning his young black wife and son for a white woman, forcing them to live on welfare. He lost the case. I'm not really surprised that that was not successful at that time. Uh, and I'm not saying that everything that he did and the way he did it was, you know, 100% correct. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I can, I mean, we're all human beings, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, we make mistakes. In the summer of 1982, Ben soon realized his reputation was getting the best of it. He decided it was time to leave Hollywood. He and Nancy packed up the family and moved to New Jersey. He wanted to get out of the spotlight. You're out of the spotlight because you're not uh, the hot list. But he never stopped working. He was always working and doing concerts and getting people to, co to come and, and see him. Besides, he was needed closer to home. His father was getting old, losing his health. And if he had doubted his dad's approval, then discovered that he had it all along. He was walking around the block talking about, that's Chicken George, that's my boy. They were calling him Daddy Chicken, <laughs> Daddy Chicken George. <laughs> he was quite proud. When his father died later that year, Ben hardly had time to grieve. His mother had been suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Six months later, in 1983, the woman who paid for his dance lessons by cleaning theaters took a sudden turn for the worse. I got a call, my mother made a transition, meaning, you know, she had passed. I could feel my mother, I could smell it just rush through me, as though she came to say goodbye. She believed in me when nobody believed in me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. All right. After the death of his parents, the 37-year-old Ben paid a visit to the old neighborhood where he grew up. The trip made him realize how far he had come and put his recent troubles into perspective. Can you see him? Sure you can. He realized that in his efforts to show his pride in being a black man, he had misjudged how others would view him. One of the few bright spots for Ben was following the progress of his second oldest daughter, Naja. Of all his kids, Naja was the one who seemed to be following in his footsteps. She had performed with the Dance Theater of Harlem, and by 1987, was getting some attention with casting agents in Hollywood. She was silly, she was smart, she was talented, and she was beautiful. On December 1st, 1987, Ben and his 16-year-old daughter, Naja, even got the chance to work together, shooting a game show pilot in Los Angeles. If the pilot was picked up, father and daughter would be seeing a lot more of each other. Those were Ben's hopes when the next day, Ben put his daughter on a plane to New Jersey. 
Ben's wife, Nancy, picked Naja up at the airport and started driving home. It was a short ride they had taken many times. Then the unthinkable happened. A tractor trailer with an unstable load tipped over and crashed onto the car. Ben's wife, Nancy, was thrown from the car and injured. His daughter, Naja, was killed. I would have gladly, and I still to this day, would have gladly to have her back, give myself. Naja was very special. Is very special. And that's all I have to say about that. We belong to that rare club, you know, of parents who've, who uh, outlived their children. And it will definitely send you reeling into uncharted waters, as it did myself, as it did Ben. And um, you splash around and you're, you're mad as hell. You're, you're insane. You're absolutely insane. And you're walking around trying to pretend that you're sane. But you're out of your mind. Ben was shattered. He withdrew from his friends and began losing himself in drugs. Cocaine, marijuana, alcohol. There isn't a drug out there, hear me, that can take away the pain of the loss of a child. It's something you have to just grip down and bear it. I was angry with God. I dare he take my baby and not ask me my permission. On New Year's Eve, 1988, at the age of 42, Ben was so depressed, he even contemplated suicide. I saw that he was basically killing himself. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? Naja, if she was here right now, she'd cry. And she wouldn't want you like this. She'd want you to be strong and be the man that you are and go on. His daughter's love cut through his drug-induced depression. Ben checked himself into a drug rehabilitation center and began the work of rebuilding his strength, rebuilding his career, and putting his life back together. By 1992, the 46-year-old Ben Vereen was trying to come to grips with the tragic loss of his teenage daughter. He put himself through drug rehabilitation therapy and was rebaptized in the Pentecostal church. And with renewed faith and optimism, Ben took off for Los Angeles on June 8th. It was a day which would test his faith as never before. Around 8 p.m., as Ben was driving to a meeting with Michael Jackson in Malibu, he dozed off and crashed his car into a tree. When the police found him, they were unsure if Ben was sober. They administered a series of sobriety tests, which he eventually passed at police headquarters. Ben was released and spent the next few hours resting at his manager's house nearby. It's still unclear why, but at 2 a.m. the next morning, Ben woke up and walked out of the house in just a pair of shorts. By 2.30, he was wandering down a deserted stretch of the Pacific Coast Highway. Suddenly, a 5,000-pound Chevy Suburban traveling at 50 miles an hour was coming his way. And so the first second, it takes your brain one second to go, there's somebody in the middle of the road. And it took the next second for me to hit the brakes. And the third second, I hit him. Ben was thrown more than 100 feet into the air, landing in a ditch on the side of the road. He was rushed to the UCLA Medical Center, and its trauma unit tried desperately to save his life. When he arrived, his chances of survival were pretty small. He was essentially comatose and completely unresponsive. His blood pressure was very low from hemorrhagic shock. He was uh, unable to breathe because there was a lot of blood in his uh, facial fractures and in his mouth and airway. Ben Vereen was on life support. Several bones in his body were broken, and he was on a breathing machine. It took him nearly three days 
to regain consciousness. When I walked in the room, it took my breath away. It is to think about losing my father. After hours of surgery and neurological testing, Ben's doctors were convinced he would need at least three years to walk normally again. His career seemed all but over. I was totally broken. They gave me a walker. I had to learn to walk again. Two feet is an effort. So you gotta build up your endurance. Over the next two months, Ben worked with physical and occupational therapists, building up the muscles in his arms and his dancer's legs. To finish his treatment, Ben was flown to the Kessler Institute in New Jersey. That October, less than four months after the accident, some friends took Ben to see the hit Broadway musical, Jelly's Last Jam, starring Gregory Hines. Gregory came out to his 100th curtain call <laughs> he stopped the applause and recognized me in the audience and everybody gave me a standing ovation to ben's surprise the producers joined gregory hines on stage as ben sat in the audience they told him an actor in the leading role was leaving the show if he could put himself back together the part would be his all I needed to hear. He couldn't run, he couldn't jump, um, he couldn't kneel, squat, any kind of make any level changes. And uh, wow, he was a whirlwind. He, he showed up every day ready to work very hard and with extreme focus. And on the night of April 8th, 1993, 10 months after he was nearly given up for dead, Ben Vereen was ready to go back onto the stage. I'm thinking, Q, Q, keep, hold it together, Bahrain, hold it together. And I started down the ramp. It was a glorious evening. Sweet Papa Jelly! Yeah. This place, what's the matter, Jelly? Don't you like the new sounds that are going down on Central Avenue? <laughs> we were all, the whole family was there. We were all just cheering. We were so proud. We were so proud at that very moment. It was like, he's back. He's back. Ben was back from the brink of death. And in the years following Jelly's last jam, he has reminded his fans of the skills that made him famous. As a dancer, that would be a record breaker. A singer and an actor. Yet in being all things to all people, Ben Vereen struggled to find his own identity. His public efforts to do so have failed spectacularly. But after 35 years in the business and all the pain he has suffered in his personal life, Ben Vereen is finally at peace with himself. Ben is like the phoenix. He just rises from those ashes. No, no matter what happens, he always comes through. He has paid his dues as a black person. I think he worked hard and, you know, uh, and earned everything that he has. He's certainly a, me a memorable character, and he's certainly going to be remembered as a very talented man, a multi-talented artist. So they'll look back at that and they'll say this was a, a very important figure, but perhaps one who didn't fulfill all of his potential. He's always had the chops, and he always gives it 100%, and that's how he lives his life. And I think if, if he lived it any other way, he wouldn't be as great as he is.